Hello, everyone. My name is Monica Dominguez, and I'm a proud member of the EMBA class of 2021, as well as a board member on the Student Leadership and Ethics Board, known as SLEB, of the Bernstein Center for Leadership and Ethics. On behalf of the center and the Healthcare Pharmaceutical Management Program at Columbia Business School, I am happy to welcome you to our program today on the COVID-19 vaccine access and role of U.S. employers. Today, we will hear from a panel of experts across the healthcare space who will be speaking to the roles and responsibilities of U.S.-based employers as it relates to the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine. We will be addressing timely and salient topics pertinent to our ever-changing world including the ethical impl implications of the vaccine mandate in the workplace, employee expectations and engagement, and communication strategies to help quell misinformation, increase understanding, and drive adoption. To set the stage, let's take a look at recent data. According to the CDC, progress has been steady in the United States the population 65 and greater has seen the most progress at 54% fully vaccinated. This drops down quite a bit to the prime category that represents the working ages of 18 to 64, with 40% of individuals having received one shot and only 23% as fully vaccinated. There are a number of factors to consider before an employee feels safe returning to work. According to data gathered by Perceptics in January, 27% feel that employees should be required to have the vaccine prior to returning to work. While there's other aspects to prepare to transition to a return to work environment, requiring a vaccine prompts additional ethical questions. In contrast, a separate survey conducted by Glassdoor shows 70% of employees think the vaccine should be required prior to returning to work. And 90% of CEOs have said that their companies will be asking workers to inform them of vaccination status prior to heading back into the office. With conflicting data and a disconnect between employers and employees and their realities, how do we truly know the sentiment in the workforce? You may have started hearing in, in the news that some employers are mandating individuals to be vaccinated. The US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission known as the EEOC allows employers to mandate vaccines for workplace safety. While the EEOC says it's fine to mandate them, employers are not unified on that. Most employers are still grappling with this, but particular organizations proceeded with firing these individuals as seen as these two cases in New York and Pennsylvania. Is this the best response to ensure a safe work environment? Today's experts will tackle difficult questions facing employers and offer suggested ways to manage this transition. This event will feature a moderated panel followed by a Q&A session. If you'd like to submit a question, please use the Q&A feature rather than the chat to submit. And finally, to introduce our moderator for the event today, Bunny Ellerin. Bunny is the director of the Healthcare and Pharmaceutical Management Program at Columbia Business School. She's also the co-founder and president of the New York City Health Business Leaders, the NYC HBL, a professional community dedicated to building a healthcare ecosystem in the New York City region. Without further ado, welcome Bunny. Thank you so much. Thank you, Monica. Um, love the data, love setting the stage with the fact that there's a lot of conflicting data out there. Um, so welcome everyone. This is a topic that is, you know, on everyone's minds. And so we're excited to talk about it today. Um, as Monica said, I know you're gonna have a ton of questions. Um, so please put them in the Q&A box, not in the chat box. And we will, we're gonna leave 15 minutes towards the end for audience Q&A. So we selected our four panelists today very intentionally because we wanted to represent the employer viewpoint, the legal viewpoint, the public health viewpoint, and all of them, all of us will also represent the employee viewpoint because um, most of us are employees. So um, I let's 
first meet our panelists. Um, Candice Sherman, you are the co-founder, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> you're the CEO of the Northeast Business Group on Health. Can um, you tell us a little bit about that and how it relates to this particular talk? Sure. So thank you for having me, Bunny. Um, happy to be here. So Northeast Business Group on Health is an employer-led coalition of healthcare stakeholders. The core of our membership are quite large companies that are headquartered in or near New York City, so the tri-state region. Um, we conduct you know, surveys, we do events, we pull together roundtables. Um, our mission is really to ensure that our members um, are informed, they have uh, information around how to get the best value out of the healthcare that they're purchasing for their employees. Um, we have been really on top of COVID-19 since uh, the unfortunate inception of the pandemic and been providing a lot of information to our members and taking their pulse um, on everything um, you could possibly imagine, including, of course, um, the vaccine situation. So um, we did recently, just a few weeks ago, uh, survey our members about their um, vaccine strategies and what they're thinking about returning to work. So I'll be happy to share some of that data as we as we move on. Fantastic. Yep. Um, Marty Sch um, Schmelkin is an attorney with Jones Day. Marty, do you want to introduce yourself and your relationship to the topic? Sure, Bunny. Thanks uh, for having me and great to be uh, with everyone. We're going to be talking about uh, uh, a lot of interesting and evolving uh, topics. Um, so uh, again, I'm a partner with the global law firm of Jones Day. I'm based in New York. I'm a labor and employment lawyer and uh, started working on COVID issues as far back as December of 2019, before the pandemic even hit the United States, uh, doing a significant amount of work with global uh, clients based in the United States having questions about this new uh, pandemic or issue that was arising uh, back then in, in Asia and moving employees around and, and what should be done. Obviously, uh, since uh, since then, uh, we've seen you know, all aspects of the um, COVID virus from um, a legal perspective, and I'll be talking today about rights and obligations, both from the employer and employee perspective. Fantastic. Matt McCambridge, who is the co-founder and CEO of the hot startup Eden Health in New York. Tell us a little bit about Eden and, and what you're doing with the vaccine rollout. Uh, thanks very much. Appreciate that uh, moniker. That's great. Um, so <clears throat> we're um, a digital first uh, medical practice. Uh, we provide patient centered care, primary care, mental health care, specialty care for our members, mostly virtual, but we also provide physical care in a bunch of different states, including New York City, New Jersey, and uh, in Illinois and Chicago. <clears throat> um, so as this integrated healthcare partner, um, we work predominantly with employers. We work with over 100 employer groups around the country supporting their national workforces and their uh, dependents. <clears throat> and then um, we also partner with landlords um, who, uh, particularly in the commercial real estate side, um, who obviously have a big part of um, returning employees to the workforce. So we have sort of the employer perspective. Um, we're a medical practice, so we put patients first from their standpoint. Um, and then we also have the landlord's perspective in terms of reoccupying uh, their commercial real estate. And so everything from, um, you know, with the pandemic, while we were predominantly medical before, um, testing, monitoring, vaccinations, et cetera, uh, as we've gone through the, the pandemic. Great. And Dr. Scott Ratson, who has multiple roles, um, but uh, you're the distinguished lecturer at the CUNY School of Public Health, um, director of CONVINCE. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. Well, thanks, Bunny. And I really appreciate being here today uh, to talk about really one of the most important issues of our time. So CONVINCE stands for COVID New Vaccine Information, Communication and Engagement. And we've housed uh, the public health side of it and research side at CUNY School of Public Health. And as you mentioned uh, in the in the intro earlier, uh, I've also been at, at Columbia Mailman School of Public Health on innovation in health communication, and most recently was working at Harvard Kennedy School in the Center for Business and Government, looking at the important aspects of vaccination in general. Uh, and then, of course, we pivoted to COVID. So. 
what I was going to be speaking about later today is a group called Business Partners to Convince, which is this whole global movement that we are attempting and hope to get not only listeners here today, but others to join uh, an initiative and a, and a movement of the importance of employers' engagement in uh, returning to COVID-19 uh, protected workplace. And I'll talk a little bit more about that with a, a global COVID uh, worksite challenge. Uh, so hopefully we'll have that opportunity uh, and hopefully we can carry on. Yep, absolutely. I mean, and so that's a great place to start. Um, you know, the vaccine rollout was a little bumpy now in New York, it's really available to everyone over 16. Um, you know, so employers are obviously thinking about how they are going to get their um, staffs back safely um, into the office. Uh, so let's start with the obvious. You know, what is the responsibility of an employer to um, have their employee vaccinated. Um, I know that there are a lot of questions around legal issues. So why don't we start with the lawyer on the on the um, panel and then um, I'm, and then all of you will chime in. So Marty. Sure, sure. So uh, we give kind of the legal grounding here from the employment law perspective. Um, the, the two laws that, that are often implicated here are the Americans with Disabilities Act and Title seven of the Civil Rights Act, right? Because any form of uh, mandatory vaccination that an employer might impose, first of all, has to have uh, carve outs for uh, uh, the, these issues, these issues implicated by these laws. Um, so as uh, Monica mentioned in her intro remarks, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, which is the federal agency which enforces the nation's civil rights laws to the workplace laws, uh, uh, issued a set of uh, guidance uh, uh, FAQs in, in mid-December. Uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, user-friendly document. If you haven't looked at it, you, know, you can take a look. Uh, it's online in the EEOC um, website for sure. Um, and uh, in mid-December, they issued uh, guidance with respect to uh, vaccinations. And again, as Monica had shared out, uh, they uh, do provide for employers mandating vaccinations prior to um, coming to uh, coming back to work. Uh, there are carve outs though, right? The carve outs again um, uh, for an individual that has a qualified disability that um, makes it makes them unable to take a, a vaccine um, or for those with a sincerely held religious belief, uh, which again is a protection under Title VII of, of the Civil Rights Act. Um, um, what we're starting to see uh, is uh, you know, certain uh, lit litigation uh, in the area of those employers that have decided to make um, uh, uh, vaccinations mandatory um, because the three vaccines um, are still uh, issued under an FDA uh, emergency youth authorization, uh, which uh, essentially, paraphrasing now, uh, provides an individual with the, the, the right to take the vaccine or not. Uh, uh, there may be litigation if an employer makes it mandatory uh, for an individual to say, well, wait a minute, under this FDA um, uh, guidance, it's issued under an EUA, um, I don't have to take the vaccine and therefore you're uh, requiring me essentially to go counter to you know, certain federal rights that I, I may have. There's gonna be a lot of litigation over this. There's one case right now that was filed in New Mexico. It's kind of the first case that's kind of testing that, uh, but we expect you know, more to come in that area. Um, okay. it, um, there, there, there are certain state laws uh, uh, that are pending, or I shouldn't say laws, uh, pending legislation in 24 different states that touch on this issue of whether or not an employer can make it a mandatory uh, condition of getting vaccinated prior to returning to the workplace. Um, so um, uh, other legal issues we can talk about you know, in yeah. our discussion here, but a, a lot there. So, yeah, so basically legally, um, Aside from the um, emergency use authorization, I get that, um, they can do it, but what are they actually doing? So I'd love to hear from both Matt and Candace about what employers really are thinking about um, because it's more than a legal decision. It's really a business decision. And um, so why don't, why don't you take it away? So, yeah. So thanks, Bunny. So, um, you know, we, as, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we surveyed um, our members. We have about 75 
large employer members and um, responded, um, about half of those responded. And I will say that two thirds of respondents um, said that they were not at this point anyway, considering any kind of a vaccination mandate. Um, and one of the primary reasons for that was just concern about how those who, for whatever reason, either you know health reasons or religious reasons or what have you, or just yeah, hesitant, um, you, you know the fairness uh, given that, and so how how would they be how would they be treated? Most um, of our members have been very vocal about um, wanting to have a strong strategy around communication and engagement. Um, and a lot of that, of course, is just in the interest of bringing, starting to bring some people back into the office. But I think there's also the fact that, you know, given all of the misinformation floating around, and we know some of it has a, you know, very political sort of slant to it. And I think there's a lot of data in the literature that shows that employers are actually, at this point, one of the most trusted sources of authoritative information. And that means that employers have a very particular role to play, really, in terms of encouraging um, vaccine adherence uh, by employees and family members. So, Matt, I know you, you've done some work as well in this area. Yeah, um, and it overlap a little bit in uh, membership in, in some ways. So the uh, for, for our uh, customers, we're actually seeing a pretty significant percentage of them requiring folks to get a vaccination before they return to the office. Um, I actually think we're gonna can see that go up further as more people return to the office more fully, um, right? Because you see a variety of people who may not have made the decision pushing that out further. I mean, the reality of the situation for employers is they have an absolute mandate to keep their facilities safe for their employees. You know, imagine them return just in the same way that an employee might be upset if they're mandated to get the vaccine. Imagine being mandated the other direction to return to work in an environment that's not safe, um, where people aren't vaccinated. So vaccinations are very clearly the tool that we see most of our employers, not all of them, but most of them knowing as the kind of key element to returning um, to work. And I think this return to work element is um, is essential because the what, what, what many of our customers uh, view besides a small subset that are really going remote is it's an essential um, uh, to their business to be able to return people in an effective way to a work environment where you can collaborate um, in your facility. And so they, some of these employers actually view it more as an existential business risk to have people not return. So um, when we are, are working with employers, you know, there's a variety of types of tools you can set up there. Vaccination is one tool. Screening is another tool. Making sure through high quality technology infrastructure that the employer itself is able to monitor their physical site safety. And then the kind of softer tools of, okay, let's get mental health available um, for folks who are returning to work. And then let's also get um, information that's trusted available. So we have a lot of our medical directors doing uh, virtual webinars with workforces talking about the vaccines, with, um, you know, concerns around efficacy around the vaccine, around um, there being, you know, risks to taking the vaccine and making sure that they actually have high quality medical guidance. So, yeah, we're probably seeing, um, I would say, from the 10 or so far, more em employers who are, are more uh, 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 pro uh, getting folks vaccinated and actually making that a mandate. So a question that has come up um, from, from viewers even before this is, okay, if there's a mandate, I don't want to do it. Um, are you going to fire me? And is that, you know, is that something to be worried about? I, I, I mean, you know, from our standpoint, you know, we're a medical organization. So anybody who's interacting with a patient, they have to be vaccinated unless there's uh, you know, some per very particular reason why not. Um, for folks who are on our corporate side, I think we have a very clear answer for folks who don't want to be vaccinated uh, at Eden, which is you don't have to come to the work site because we've moved into a more flexible model. Um, and so I think it's important to, um, uh, to accommodate them in an effective way. But I think when you're dealing with hundreds 
thousands, you know, even dozens of employees, you know, it's really important to think about how does the vast, vast majority of that workforce need to operate? And then how do you make sure it's effective for people who aren't able to return to that, to that work site? So upgrading the audio visual capabilities in your conference room is, you know, kind of no brainer uh, to make that more effective. I'm sure Martin will have something to say about accommodations because that is clearly um, a big issue. But I will also say that, you know, one tool um, that employers really should have in their toolbox, but they don't quite yet because it's been sort of de-emphasized in favor of vaccines, understandably, but is the production of these very fast, cheap uh, tests, you know, that more and more will be coming to market. And so when you think about um, a strategy that might combine, you know, vaccines with an aggressive, uh, aggressive testing program. Once those, you know, cheap and quick tests are available, you can imagine people taking them daily um, or at least several times a week. That could really improve um, the capability of employers to bring people back into the office, even in the in the in the uh, presence of some folks who have not been vaccinated. So, Martin, I'm I'm sure you you want to pipe in around the comments. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Workplace accommodations, and that 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 will be one of them. Um, again, you know, as Matt said, you know, allowing individuals to continue to work from home is obviously another. Uh, setting up sections on certain floors, right, for vaccinated versus unvaccinated individuals, you know, creates other issues. And by the way, um, you know, those of us you know tuning in from New York. Uh, many states, New York State, you know, in particular, has the New York Forward Plan and and guidelines for uh, office uh, reopening. Right um, at at present, those really haven't changed uh, in in any way uh, since last June, uh, when it, it, office employees could return to offices. Um, uh, I would expect um, that to change as more and more individuals uh, get vaccinated and. Will there be further guidance from New York State as to uh, you know, um, workplace rules for vaccinated versus unvaccinated individuals? So uh, stay tuned. It is evolving. Uh, we'll also see changes, by the way, or, or directives in all likelihood from federal OSHA uh, in this area. Uh, we know the Biden administration is, is obviously very focused on this as well. So uh, more to come. So, Scott, you know, I, I see a ton of people on LinkedIn and Twitter, you know, posting their they're getting their shot you know, wherever they're getting it. Um, CEOs are doing it, um, you know, as a form of communication and getting people engaged in it. You're an expert in communications. And so what do you, what do you think the employer's role is here? And, you know, should they be uh, communicating about that, you know, getting the vaccine? Well, well, thanks, Bunny. And I think Monica really um, showed at the outset the challenges that we face wherever we are, that 30% of the population on some of the best polls are unwilling to get a vaccine. And let's think where we were a year ago in New York. We had over 800 people die one year ago in one day. We had over 5,000 deaths this first week of April. We've come a long way, but we have real risks if we don't approach this in a methodical way with effective communication. And I think the workplace, what we want to call them mandates, may be too far, but there are activities that Matt and Candace have mentioned of conditions of work, whether you need to work it in on site or uh, have any interaction. So there's lots of things that can be done. I think the major piece though is that we have to get people who are vaccine ready vaccinated. And we've had challenge with that. We've had challenge because of access. We've had challenge because of, frankly, um, some poor systems that have been put in place uh, in terms of even scheduling as well as the distribution. We also can add better distribution where all health facilities have it uh, or doctor's offices have it. That's where people want to go to get, get vaccinated. And as appropriate, if there will be opportunities for workplace programs, that that could happen as well, that we might have necessary in the fall when we have seasonal flu vaccines, which will be required again or should be required in many places, as well as the potential for boosters down the road. But the most important thing right now is to deal with hesitance by showing that it's the right thing to do. Uh, it's good to protect yourself, clearly. Uh, secondly, for the community. And thirdly, whether it's the New York Forward or any of these other aspects, to not have another wave or a problem that's going to set us back. We need to have a vaccination at an 80% rate, and we're far from it. Uh, so we're working on a lot of different pro 
projects. I can mention more what we've done with the U.S. Council for International Business on business partners to convince. But we've got other activities that I think we'll be, you know, talking about here of what you know Matt has said has been working with the technologies and Candice's group has put out a lot of great um, resources. But there's a lot more that we have to continue to do, and and even this dialogue uh, today hopefully will will continue that with many of the the people who are listening. You know, and Scott, I do think the good news is that employers have, for the most part, at least our membership, have really been stepping up and understanding the important role that they have to play. I will say that over the last several months, many of our members have been, you know, contacting state, local, federal authorities to, to raise their hand and say, you know, we want to help with distribution. Um, up until this point, uh, that supply has been held pretty closely at the state level. Um, it differs in some other states, obviously, but they've been eager to play an active role in helping with distribution. And certainly many of them have that capability through, you know, on-site clinics or other types of vaccination programs that they have. So hopefully that will begin to happen in a much more um, aggressive way in the months to come. I just want to echo that, you know, as an employer, um, first of all, it's an, a place to have potentially high rates of transmission at a work site with that, that's density, uh, you know, with a lot of density. And so that from that standpoint, I think it's really important that they play a role. The other standpoint, I think it was mentioned earlier by a couple of folks is that many employers are the, are the trusted resource in the lives of their workforce. And so, you know, what we're seeing employer, our, our customers do is invite our medical directors and uh, on the mental health side, as well as the, um, on the clinical side, um, the clinical, excuse me, from the physical health side um, to their all hands. And so many companies virtually have moved to have all hands. And then so we'll have education about the vaccine during these otherwise company mandated sessions. And so, you know, just yesterday there was a uh, organization with over 350 of their executive team and, and group who had their all hands where we had this, um, you know, a, a session run with them uh, from our medical directors. And so this has been happening much more frequently, but really leveraging that I think is extremely important. And then finally, you know, I would say that the, um, the ease of access is something that is important. Um, you've got a lot of motivated people who've currently gotten the vaccine who have gone to countless different websites and, you know, they're calling the labs, you know, at night and trying to get the lab, well, the pharmacies, et cetera, to try to get the extra doses. But you've got a lot of people where that's a bridge too far and they're just not going to do it. And so making sure that you, uh, it, you know, if it's important to you, you're organization gets vaccinated, make sure it's simple, make sure the location is easily accessible, make sure that you're, you know, you're sharing those resources because the ease of access is, is actually a huge barrier as it is really all health um, to, to actually comply. Bunny, as the, as the lawyer on the panel here, I just want to throw up with the, the yellow caution flag. I, I, although I agree conceptually with everything that Matt and Candace just shared out, uh, you have to be very careful in making your decision as to Will you, again, educate and encourage your people to get vaccinated and then give them the resources and direct them to the third party completely separate from you? Or will you be doing it on site in a partnership, perhaps with an organization? And if it's the latter, uh, then obviously greater, greater, greater care needs to be taken on your part as the employer, as the organization uh, to make sure things like uh, liability waivers, indemnification clauses, the, all the contract bells and whistles and, you know, unfortunately, look, like any, any crisis, uh, often what crops up is the cottage industry of, of individuals and entities that really have no business in, in doing some of this type of work. And, and, and so turning to trusted partners, um, I'll give a plug to Candace and to Matt uh, and organizations that, that they have connectivity with uh, is the way to go, not just the fly-by-nights that might say, hey, we can come on site and do uh, COVID testing or vaccinations. And, and uh, they, they really have no business doing that. So uh, let's go back to this ease of access because I think that's a really um, another important point. Um, what else can employers do to provide? Like, I'm just thinking, you know, I just saw from Columbia, um, they issued an announcement yesterday that they will give four hours of PTO if you want to get your vaccine. So if you, eight hours total. Um, we've seen, you know, some companies giving rewards, right? Or gift cards or, you know, um, 
lot or basically a benefit for doing this. So are those effective? What what's your take on on some of this? Well, um, oh, I'm sorry, Scott. Go ahead. Yeah. I'll just just quickly mention, and Candace might have some specific uh, recommendations. We've been actually speaking about this for a long time, from the behavioral economics side all the way to is it the right thing to do? Uh, and I think those are those are different questions. Uh, incentives do work, yet at the same time, we have found in even our our surveys, and we've been running a tracking survey since last March, that some people the vaccine when you ask them wait and see some of them are waiting to see how much money i get or how much time off i get or something that's not wait and see on side effects that we might think so it's really important to understand the motivating forces and you know maybe there are you know legal aspects on on the risk side and maybe there are opportunities on on the carrot side um, with these incentives but we are you know as a public health communication professional, I suppose you could call me, or academic in this area, there's nothing more important than getting to this herd immunity or community protection. And we need to try different approaches for different people, all within an ethical framework. And if it can be done by the employer, great. And that's why we have business partners to convince and a whole worksite challenge to help foster that environment. But there's also other ways that we have to keep pivoting to and um, you know, figuring out as the employer, as the trusted source, can, can deliver the information and help people make the appropriate decisions, which we also call vaccine literacy. So I think, um, so it is the case actually that New York State mandates that employers must give employees four hours um, off to get their first shot and an additional four hours to get their second shot, um, which is great. Um, there are employers who have been thinking about or perhaps offering some incentives. Um, I will say that um, you know, time off, I think, is one of the most important incentives, um, especially given, you know, there's certainly it is the case that after the second shot, there are about, I don't know, roughly a quarter of people who are having, you know, side effects 24, 48 hours. So if employees can be assured that it's OK, you know, to take the next day off if they're not feeling well or maybe encouraged even to get their shot, you know, later in the week so they have the weekend to recover. I think that's um, helpful. But I do think that one of the most important incentives, um, as it were, is really storytelling. So the ability of employees to hear from their colleagues that they went and they got a vaccine, they had a good experience, they feel good about that. I mean, many people um, have been, you know, talking about, and I'm, I had this experience and maybe some of you had, you know, just a, a, a very emotional experience after what we've been through over the last year, being able to go and get this vaccine and know that science has produced this in record time. I mean, it's just this tremendous uh, thing and it's an emotional experience and you just feel happy to have it. So I think the extent to which um, employers can, uh, you know, encourage the sharing of stories, whether via, you know, their own internal social media sites or having their CEOs talk about, you know, their own experiences, family members. The thought that your colleagues have gotten the, the vaccine, they had a good experience, you know, maybe they had some side effects, but they were gone in a day or two and they feel like it was a, a safe, good experience. That, I think, that is almost the most important incentive um, to be had. Yeah, I think one of the one of the takeaways in my mind is, you know, despite the fact that it feels like there's, you know, uncertainty around this time, there are really actually, in my opinion, quite clear steps that you can take as an employer that we sort of all know that we can do. One of them is have a, a medical professional or somebody who's trusted talk about the efficacy of these vaccines uh, in front of your, your workforce. That's definitely one. The second is provide accommodations so people can get access to the vaccine. That's another one. I think the question for you is how far do you want to go? Let's say you wanted to go to bring it to the work site over time. You know, you can, as a, so we're a medical organization, which is helpful in a lot of ways um, to be the people doing this because we're the, a primary care provider for, for folks. So the patient or the employer, employee, excuse me, individually consents to us. You know, we hold all of the insurance 
um, that that's the certificates of insurance that's necessary to perform these kinds of things at the work site. But you know, if the individual is individually consenting to access to care, and you and you have a coverage like for certificate of insurance, and then you have a space that's provided by you or the building, it's it's a pretty st- clear pathway in order how, how to actually uh, deliver that. And then I would say the additional component to this is provide uh, resources. Um, uh, off ramps or on ramps, whatever you want to call it, to folks who have concerns. And so, and for the folks who have concerns, um, access again to mental health resources, access to individual conversations with folks from HR who are trained in this kind of thing. I think that it's it, the blueprint is is there. I think it exists now. And so, as an employer uh, uh, adjudicates that, you know, there's a lot of resources out there that you can you can use um, to feel like you're doing this in an informed and high quality way. One wrap up point, Bunny, if I can, on on, on um, incentives, right? Because we are seeing that, right? You know, $100 per dose um, or the gift cards, uh, et cetera. I, I, I make two points here. One is um, you need to be careful as to, you know, making the incentive not so um, generous that an individual starts to feel that it's less voluntary. Uh, it's, it's essentially an offer I can't refuse. Um, and it starts to skew that way, particularly, again, if you're in a non-mandatory vaccination regime. But the, uh, the other issue from a, a, um, a discrimination perspective, you have to be very careful of the following. Um, it cannot have any incentive you give can't have an adverse impact on those who can't take the vaccine because they have a disability or because of a sincerely held religious belief. So in implementing uh, such an incentive uh, program, you have to uh, provide an ability for those individuals to also get that incentive, right? So maybe it's uh, you get the same $75 per dose if you watch a, a video on COVID uh, prevention or you read this pamphlet and you uh, fill out a questionnaire. Whatever it is, uh, you have to allow those individuals who can't take the vaccine an opportunity to get that same back, uh, same incentive. Duly noted, Counselor. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so in New York, uh, we hear about this vaccine passport, right? It's called the Excelsior Pass. Um, and I think it's only valid in New York and maybe other states have that vaccine. So do you think that's something that employers are going to ask for? Like when you check in, give your vaccine passport or what's your feeling on vaccine passports? So we are getting a lot of questions um, around vaccine passports. Um, And I think that, you know, right now, obviously given issues around access and distribution of the vaccine and, you know, uh, all of that, um, it would not be appropriate to to be using it um, in a widespread way until everyone who wants a vaccine can get one. But I do think that over time, I do think that this whole idea of vaccine passports, especially for employers who may want employees to be traveling on business or going to conferences and events and things like that, um, I think there's going to be a huge amount of interest in uh, the whole idea of a vaccine passport, especially for certain activities. Uh, I would would definitely agree. And I was a couple thoughts here. One is they're definitely not all the same, you know, the vaccine passports going to uh, a Madison Square Garden concert is is a bit of a different situation than going to, you know, your factory or your office where you need to actually go work there. Right. And so there's definitely different components of this. And and, 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 and so I, I do think that they're sometimes they're kind of painted as a one size fits all situation. You know, what we're definitely seeing is folks, uh, employers looking for the ability to have limited confirmation around vaccinations. Um, limited, I, I mean, to the status of whether or not that group has been vaccinated. So having the technology um, system on the back end that uh, keeps the privacy of the individual um, uh safe for their whole health record, but but also provides the ability to verify that as employers can do for folks coming into their work site, I think is also uh, important. And um, the other thing I'll mention is that I see this evolving actually over time for employers to include other types of vaccinations, right? Imagine the flu vaccine. You know, this is gonna be much more prominent 
employers already deliver these things at their work site, but the confirmation that you've received that is going to be more common. Um, if we're creating a new uh, 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 vaccines around variants or, um, you know, we're, we're going to be getting it on an ongoing basis, this is going to be something that is probably going to be around for a while. And so we definitely see a lot of inter interest amongst employers around that. But I think you can kind of, ref in our opinion, you could reframe it a bit to say, uh, what is a longer term strategy around keeping your workforce safe from communicable, you know, diseases? Yeah, and, and I would echo, I think Matt did a great job of saying it, uh, it needs to be part of a broader strategy as well as consider the, the privacy issues, as well as the fact that 11% of Americans don't have a government issued ID uh, and all of them don't have access to to cell phones or smartphones or even even phones in that in, in that matter. So we need to consider ways that it would be both equitable and also if people don't get vaccines, as Martin mentioned, that, that small percentage, there are other ways for whatever kind of certification. So some of them also have testing integrated or recent testing, lots of different pieces. There's a lot to work out, but again, I would like to say we focus on the public health aspect now, get people who are vaccine ready and vaccine amenable vaccinated and by doing that, we'll have you know, less cases, less prevalence of, of COVID, and then the opportunity where this bas vaccine passport discussion is not front and center, but just maybe a nice to have, which I think Matt was referring to if you wanted to go to Madison Square Garden for a concert, which is different than must have for getting on an airplane, for example. So very different. And even we have to work on the terminology. Is it a passport? Is it a credential? Is it, what, what is it exactly? And, and I'll just add one, one quick legal aspect to this too. Uh, again, in the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission FAQs that I referred to earlier, make clear that an employer can ask for proof of a vaccination, right? Um, and uh, whether it's this Excelsior Pass or the card that you uh, get and you run over to Staples and get it laminated or whatever, I don't know if that's a good thing to do now or not, uh, but in any event, um, you know, being able to show that proof um, um, you know, is something an employer can ask for. Okay, we have so many questions. We've never seen this many questions. So um, I'm gonna get started with audience Q&A. And audience, we have a bunch here, but if you are so inclined, um, type it into the Q&A box. Um, so with the pandemic, working from home for many people has become sort of the new, you know, the new normal. Um, and now that we may be returning to work, what are you seeing in terms of employers shifting how they think about work and letting or, you know, encouraging either letting them or encouraging them to continue working from home. I'm curious, work, our audience is curious. So this is huge. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, the pandemic, um, just like it's accelerated, telehealth dramatically has accelerated this idea of working remotely. Um, and certainly there are employers, you know, in our membership who feel strongly that being in the office is important in terms of, um, you know, culture, productivity and what have you. I would say the majority um, are, ex you know, seriously considering if they have already not decided to have some type of a permanent work from home scenario, whether it is that you can, you know, come into the office a couple of days a week and work from home on the remaining days, whether it's a week on, a week off. Um, we have employers who have, you know, gone through recruiting for new positions um, and brought on board people who will never appear in the office. You know, they've been hired from other states, um, are able to work remotely and never the twain shall meet. Um, and so I think that, you know, we are going to be, I, I personally think Matt may have a different perspective on this. I do think we are undergoing sort of a revolution in how people are working that will result in, you know, fairly dramatically reduced uh, real estate footprints in some cities um, and locations and much more, if not a work from home environment, certainly a vastly more flexible uh, work arrangement. Um, I, I'm not sure I have that, a, a, a totally different perspective on that really. I think that my, my viewpoint is more that, you know, every company pre COVID had some number of remote 
people, right? Like it might be small, but you had some remote people for sure. You had folks who uh, maybe had some regional offices. Uh, I definitely see the move towards much more flexibility. Um, you know, that's what we've done with our own workforce. Some people, we've had a much higher percentage of remote. And then we also are um, uh, uh, really focusing the facilities themselves around collaboration. Um, and so I think that type of model is something that we're seeing a lot in our companies, but we're really seeing the very rare group to go fully remote. I just think that that's not something that most organizations are really ready for. Maybe if you're highly technology oriented, there's been some obviously famous examples of that working quite well. But for the most part, um, we see people understanding they need to have a physical site or want to have a physical site for whatever reason. Let, let me throw in there the following. Um, again, focus New York for a moment. Uh, the, the New York office guidelines remain at 50% occupancy, right? So until that's lifted to some extent, up to 75%, and you know, we, we, we would expect it to go up, uh, uh, you're, 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 you know, most employers are going to have to have an A team and a B team, you know, uh, to rotate uh, to meet those requirements. The, 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 um, the other thing I'm seeing, which is interesting, with Matt, that you know, historically there's always been some aspect of remote or telecommuting, et cetera. And, and obviously, you know, by, uh, you know, early to mid-March of last year, you know, immediately all the offices emptied and everyone started just working remotely as we continue to do so without formal policy catching up with it, right? So I'm now seeing an uptick from clients asking to help revise or draft from scratch for the first time telecommuting policies, right? Um, things like confidentiality, safeguarding your work materials, things that you know, hopefully everyone is just doing and employers I think are trusting their employees to do it right. Uh, but now you know, formalizing it, particularly if we're gonna have more and more people working remotely in a post COVID world. Um, another topic that's coming up um, is around the racial equity lens. And um, what you're seeing in the workplace, you know, in terms of hesitancy, but also um, it's, you know, sometimes it's not just access, it's a single parent. They have no child, you know, they have no way to get to this or um, somebody who's working in like as a frontline worker. So uh, can you address how that's being handled? So that's a that's an excellent point, Bunny. I think that um, you know what we're seeing is that the combination of the COVID nineteen pandemic and the movement for social justice that started you know in in the summer well it didn't start but accelerated certainly in the summer with Black Lives Matter uh, protests around the country have really um, magnified for employers the importance of having robust. Um, equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, programs, initiatives, and what have you in place. And um, some of the programs and benefits that employers have put in place are things like, you know, um, providing a certain number of days or hours for childcare, uh, for caregiving of elderly folks. Uh, you know, so different things um, that really speak to some of the difficult issues um, that uh, that folks do have, single mothers, you know, folks uh, that are working on the front lines or what have you. And I think that that certainly helps in terms of providing more equity um, for access and what have you. Um, and I do think that a good number of employers uh, are working on messaging around vaccines, um, specifically, you know, target to BIPOC populations within their workforce and um, bringing in, um, for example, example, you know, community leaders, um, other types of people that uh, employees will look up to who may be part of the same, you know, types of diverse populations to, to speak to the benefits of vaccines. So I think that that is really important. Yeah, and, and if I could just mention, I think uh, the aspects around equity are, are key. And this is why even in our our global COVID-19 workplace challenge that we have equity as an important part of that, but also for businesses to engage with communities, schools, faith-based organizations, public health leaders, and other groups, including local government as appropriate, that are doing their best to you know, raise the tide for everybody. We found in New York that for example, the idea of getting everyone to go to Yankee Stadium or to Javits Center is not what many communities would like. 
Uh, and certainly we found in the, uh, the say African American and Latina uh, Latina communities in in Harlem, they were much more interested in going to their doctor's office or a healthcare community health center than they were to even go to the pharmacy. And last on the list, oftentimes was the workplace or again, you know, uh, a, a major stadium or even the mobile health units that they're trying. So we need to, to match what the reality is of people's lives, as Candace mentioned, childcare, you mentioned, Bunny, all these other issues, and really uh, having r- rising tides for everybody. And business has a role to play. And joining the, a challenge or engaging with the community is another important resp- responsibility. And it's not just corporate social responsibility in that box or not just e- ESG in that box. This is a fundamental corporate equity role in society to play, and nothing is more important than right now of getting us moving forward in this uh, addressing COVID. Yeah, and just just building off that for a moment, we've got um, you know in Chicago we partner with a federally qualified health center called uh, Iman, and in their community to provide um, uh, vaccinations, and this is you know. They've been around for 25 years. Folks know them. They're part of that community in a very high quality way. And it's you would never get the uptake um, from having somebody just roll in there um, without any roots in the community and expect folks to to then be trusting of that. So, you know, it's definitely what, what we're seeing. And I think for employers, you know, the reality is you live in the same city as or community as folks who are um, going to have hesitancy around this. And it's important that you support that because it impacts your workforce and impacts your, you know, yourself and your employees very, very significantly. I've seen a, an uptick in, in the following. I do a lot of work with, with um, employers on the rollout and implementation of corporate diversity, equity, inclusion programs, particularly making sure legal guardrails are placed around them. Um, and I've seen a, 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 a um, very big focus on the um, inclusion aspect of it, right? COVID, working from home, we know how hard inclusion is inside the workplace, let alone when we're all remote. So for our diverse populations, what else can we be doing to make sure that we have that connectivity uh, uh, when we're all you know, scattered about? Um, and, then, and then on the roll back in to return to office, you know, what will that look like? So the inclusion um, aspect of the DEI is, is the big piece I'm seeing with employers. We have time for um, one more question, and it's it's around privacy. You know, in, in healthcare, we've been talking about HIPAA and privacy for years, signing the form, nobody reads it. But, you know, here we are um, asking people to reveal, you know, their vaccination status. Um, what, you know, and with vaccine passports, the same thing with the card from, that we got, you know, when we got our vaccine. What are employers thinking about vis-a-vis um, privacy issues. And uh, so, curious. So I think, you know, certainly privacy, um, you know, HIPAA and all the rest of it um, is always in the forefront of employers' minds. Um, And, you know, there were a lot of questions, um, perhaps earlier on in the vaccine rollout about some of the issues that Martin has spoken about. Um, So I think, it, you know, I think a lot of those have been answered, um, though I'm sure there are others that have not yet been answered. I, I will say that I think that the life and death um, nature of this pandemic um, has put a little bit of a different twist on those concerns, which doesn't mean that those concerns are no longer there. Um, but I think um, certainly entities are thinking about the trade offs between privacy and the fact that this is a life and death situation. Any other comments on privacy? Um, the, the, the only other comment I'll add here is, um, again, the Americans with Disabilities Act um, provides protections to individuals in the workplace uh, and precludes an employer from asking disability related questions uh, unless, again, someone is seeking a medical accommodation, you know, the usual um, that you would do through your HR department. So the EEOC has been very clear, again, in these FAQs that, um, you know, take the um, you know, proof of vaccination question, uh, that in and of itself is not deemed to be a disability related question. Uh, I think where employers and HR professionals have to be careful is if someone says uh, no, 
uh, then the follow-up question is, well, uh, why not? You know, do you have a disability? What is the disability? You know, what are you suffering from? And, and a litany of questions along those lines um, that would be, uh, you know, create other, other issues and the like. Um, okay, just actually, we have a little bit more time. Um, as, as an employee, assume you're talking not to the employers, but to employees. What type of advice would each of you give to an employee going back to work, trying to figure out the whole safety issue, um, you know, just having not been there in a year, you know, many of us haven't been to an office in a year. I know that there are mental health issues. There are all kinds of safety issues. So what are, kinds, what are things that you would encourage employees to think about as they return to work? Well, I think certainly be informed about what guidelines and safety precautions your employer, your company has put in place and understand those. Um, and then think personally about, you know, to what extent you feel comfortable making sure that you have a good mask or two masks if you're into double masking. Um, you know, think about how you get to work and how safe you feel, you know, in terms of those different methods. Um, and then just being aware if you are, you know, experiencing a lot of stress or anxiety, which I think a lot of people are about going back into the office or reaching out for uh, whatever mental health um, services or, you know, uh, technology is available to you to, to kind of help um, and talk to your colleagues. I would, I would just add that uh, you don't just get all of your information from your employer. So the latest public health guidance that you're getting, not only from your locality, maybe the state, maybe the federal government to pay attention to, to those pieces. Uh, and, you know, your family should be vaccinated as well, even though that might not be the employer uh, role, but uh, clearly as, as an employee, uh, one ought to think about that. And then secondly, I think uh, be able to understand that business has an, an active and ongoing role and each big business or each employer should also have feedback loops uh, for listening to employers, con employees concerns as they go forward, as well as addressing those and not just triaging to some amorphous website or uh, whether it's a governmental or health plan and so forth, but really to address it at the point of, of concern and interest and really have that strong employer employee relationship, which is why there is a trusted, uh, a high trusted source of employers. So it, it's a, it's a role of thinking yourself not as a receiver as an employee, but really as an active member and hopefully, you know, building good business that's good for society. Yeah, I think that uh, not only being informed of the latest information, but, you know, we've kind of alluded to it a couple of times, but also being informed of the resources that you do have through your employer. Much of the time they will have had, you know, many employers will have mental health resources where they've particularly engaged an outside um, organization to, to, to help you navigate to those. Um, they'll, you know, you'll have uh, sometimes in the case of someone like us, you also have um, primary care providers, specialty providers who you can access both virtually and in person. Um, so I do think that there's a lot of resources that employers have that if you've never been on that resource page in the internal wiki, you know, log on to that, familiarize yourself, um, because I do think that there's a lot of um, access there and resources that you can take advantage of. So I, I, I generally only advise employers, but taking that hat off and putting on my employee or a, an employee hat, I should say. Um, look, I, I would just echo what everyone else said, right? But my lens is different from a legal lens, right? You get, get, get informed. There's an incredible amount of information on legal rights and legal obligations on, on, for employers out there, right? The New York Forward Plan, uh, you know, go to newyork.org, look at that. Look at the EEOC guidelines that I've been referring to. Uh, you know, keeping abreast of, you know, a, a lot of these are, are, are legal developments that are being reported in the popular press, right? Monica had a couple of the headlines in her opening um, uh, slides. Uh, so, so understanding what your rights are and what the obligations are an employer. And as, as Candace shared out, if, uh, you know, I, ideally your employer is going to provide you with a set of guidelines uh, before you come back into the office, read through them. If you think there's a gap, something's missing, you know, contact HR, ask them about it. And I'm sure there'll be a, a quick remedy on that as well. 
Okay, well, we could go on for, you know, several more hours. Um, you've all been so um, informative and uh, it's, it's been a, a great experience. I've learned a ton. We posted some resources in chat. Um, we are gonna send out a feedback survey, which we hope that you'll um, complete. And we'll, we'll also list the resources there. I wanna thank Candace Sherman, Marty Schmelkin, Matt McCambridge, Scott Ratson for spending this time with us and educating the community on you know, how we get back to work. So thanks all and look forward to seeing you in real life one day soon. Thanks very much. Take care. Thanks. And thanks, thanks, thanks to all. Columbia and the Bernstein Center. Thank you so much for your partnership.